at the Los Angeles Times, and I need to put caffeine on the computer. Okay. Uh, and I work at the Los Angeles Times on a thing called the Data Desk. Uh, we're a team of journalists, programmers, uh, analysts. We're kind of small across the newsroom. Uh, and I'm here to tell you how we use uh, open source tools, open data, and all that good stuff in the service of the news. So let's go. Uh, journalists are really good at getting data. It's a large part of our job. We request things all the time. We've got stacks and stacks and stacks of the stuff, uh, sometimes less digital than others. But um, our, our one real big problem that we have is we're really bad at storing it and maintaining it. This is one of our like many shared drives. I call them earth, wind, and fire. I don't really understand it. There's a plant. It gets eaten by the animal. It goes off on the wind. Those are the drive names. This is Gaia. It contains our GIS data. And it's, it's kind of a mess. Um, so anytime I need you know, census data or something that's joined to a file I need, I've got to dive into this, or, or more likely ask Doug or Sandy, my colleagues, what was going on in their heads. And they have to spend 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and figure out where my data is. Um, so one of, one of the things that we've been doing lately is we've been using uh, PostGIS to store uh, all of our data, which is really, really helpful. Um, and this guy at the uh, Chicago Tribune created this thing called the Boundary Service API, Django Boundary Service. And we've been using it to store uh, some of our most commonly used public shape files. And this has been sort of a, a revelation for us. Um, you know, we, get, we can store everything, download it, whatever format we want. And then it's got a querying feature. So if you run a search, um, it can tell you, say, so I did a search on where the LA Times is uh, in downtown Los Angeles. It gives you the census place, the tract, the statistical area. Um, I can then go and download any of those files, see exactly, um, you know, I can, I can go look at the shapes that they fall in, uh, download in bulk. And uh, this, this has been sort of a, a huge relief for us. And we love PostGIS, and we love GeoDjango. Um, and this is just one of our many uses of it. GeoDjango is amazing. It's, if you don't know, uh, Django is a uh, Python web framework. It has hooks into PostGIS, which is you know, like a geospatial engine in Postgres, the database. Um, it allows us to do some really awesome things that you would have to maybe dive into like ArcGIS or QGIS before. Um, it lets us say, like, we have a homicide app that tracks every homicide in LA County since 2007. Uh, if I wanted to say, find the average age of every homicide around a certain point, it's that, that query down there, the, the nearby equals, uh, that's it, you know. And I don't have to dive into ArcGIS and uh, click through a couple of things and maybe forget exactly what I did. This is kind of one of my little uh, standard rants, is when you use something like ArcGIS or QGIS, you're kind of clicking through the motions. Uh, you might wind up with a million little files like this, maybe like version one, version two, version old, version new, version publish. Um, <laughs> And with, with something like uh, GeoDjango or PostJS, you know, SQL queries, I can write it all out as a recipe, as a series of steps, and then it's reproducible. And if I change something, I can go back and I can change it and I can rerun the whole analysis without, say, diving into version 1.3, or is it version 1.4, or is it, I don't know. So uh, the, GeoDjango has been sort of a revelation for us, and we use it for analysis all the time. Uh, if I want a one-off story, like let's say that somebody asked for the average age of homicides around a certain point, if I want to one-off for a story, I can dive into my terminal, write it, or save it as a file, and then we can rerun it whenever the hell we want uh, with new data. We also do it with uh, ongoing data. So this is still the homicide report, and this is one of our front ends. Uh, and this shows you sort of the deadliness as far as homicides go, for all of the neighborhoods in LA County, we have a, a project called Mapping LA, where we split up Los Angeles, which is a, a huge, huge county with 88 separate cities inside of it, into uh, individualized neighborhoods based off of census data, so we can run uh, you know, advanced analysis on stuff. And this is based off of population and uh, the density, the actual size of the neighborhoods. It tells you sort of where the most deadly neighborhoods are. This is ongoing. Every morning, the same code runs that I've written out my recipe, uh, telling it how to calculate the sort of deadliness of these neighborhoods. And this is the last 12-month analysis. So this takes the last 12 months of homicide data and keeps it constantly updated on the website, so I don't ever have to go and rerun stuff. Uh, we do the same thing for crime data. Uh, this is violent crime in LA County. We have uh, LAPD and Sheriff's Department crime that we get uh, on an ongoing basis. And every time we get it, my, uh, my colleague Ben Welsh wrote this. It goes in, it runs the analysis, 
puts it up on the on the website, and we just have constant ongoing analysis that we never have to rerun again unless we screw something up and then we have to go fix it. Um, and so we don't even just put it on there. We actually use it to like robo text things. This is what we call when we sort of create uh, you know news you know sentences, sort of traditional news sentences uh, based off of data. So I pulled for the last 12 months, you know, Westmont has been the most deadly neighborhood out of LA County's 270 neighborhoods. This gets updated all the time. If that changes, that text will change along with it. Um, for the crime, when we get new crime updates, uh, first my colleague goes in, he looks at it and makes sure that, you know, we've gotten valid data. It's the Sheriff's Department is sometimes uh, not the best. Compton had last September with no crime. No, wait, it didn't. They just didn't geocode. They didn't put any of the addresses into their system. So we got a whole month without addresses for Compton in September, and Compton had a huge dip. How about that? Um, so, but every time he gets new crime data, this sort of automatically goes and writes itself and posts it into LA Now, our news blog, uh, along with a map showing which neighborhoods, and then you, all those links link into his uh, crime database. So on an ongoing basis, we run analysis using GeoDjango and PostGIS, uh, and so we never have to touch an ArcGIS or a QGIS panel again unless we're inspecting stuff. Um, and that's sort of how we do a lot of our analysis. You know, this is sort of like, we use it for display too, and this is sort of like the recent survey of like Google Maps in the news. Uh, the top left was the first homicide report map. It was pretty great actually. You could filter in the JavaScript. That predates me. The bottom left is the Washington Post. The top right, you can see by that stylized T, is the uh, New York Times. And we've got WNYC's uh, fusion tables based uh, census maps. And we were, you know, no stranger to Google Maps. Uh, it was great. We used open layers at the time and we pulled in Google tiles. And it was fine, you know, as long as Google didn't say anything about it, you know, we were fine using their tiles until they did say something about it. <laughs> and they, you know, asked the Tribune company, our parent company, for, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to continue using maps across all of their properties. And we didn't really want to pay that. We don't have a lot of money. We were in bankruptcy at the time. So, uh, you know, uh, if you guys remember Every Block, uh, this guy Paul Smith at Every Block wrote this in 2008 on how to do your own map stack. And this was sort of the first, uh, I think, experience that, that I had or, and my colleagues had to uh, using your own your own tile styles, you know, your own tile server. We had never really even dreamed of that before. And then we saw this, and all we wanted were our own custom styles. But at the time, we just didn't have the knowledge uh, to do it. And I don't think the tools were quite there yet to dem democratize it. So like that, that thing, that chart on the right, scared the crap out of us. Uh, you know, like what, how does MapNIC work? And what, what's a tile cache? And we can barely put together a web server, let alone all these other servers. Um, and so we, we, were, we had always wanted to do it. And finally, we had to because we didn't want to pay money. And so, but along had come Tile Mill and Amazon S3, which totally blew our minds. I could hit a button, uh, blast some tiles onto my hard drive, and then just upload it to S3 and serve it for pennies, just mere pennies. We serve, we serve, uh, a, t a custom tile set now, and we pay next to nothing for it. Um, so we, we went up first go at it. We did kind of a Google Maps looking style of uh, LA. I uploaded it to a, a rickety FTP server that we had at the time, and we did we hosted a map of you know deaths during the uh, 1992 LA riots, and that was a, that was a pretty good first start. And then uh, Ben went and found an old print map we had done. Uh, using sort of muted styles to put uh, data layers on top of it. And he tried to ape that a little bit, and we got what we call Quiet LA, uh, which we have open sourced. Uh, it's on GitHub. You can see the address up there. Um, it's, got a, it's a really great muted style for putting data on top, and we, we probably use it for more than we should at this point. It was you know, originally meant to like, layer data on top, and now we use it for it's kind of our signature map style. We would love it if you guys, you know, if you guys want to use it and adapt it to your area. It works well in Southern California and San Francisco, but I'm not quite sure how it works on the rest of the country or the rest of the world. So if anyone wants to take a look and uh, render out some tiles for the area, would, patches are most definitely welcome. Um, you know, you can see this is it in action. This is version, you know, 0.4 at this point. Uh, this is the homicide report which is based off of completely like open, open software and uh, data that we get from the coroner, it's open data, uh, what, on open street map tiles and using leaflet and uh, leaflet marker cluster. And so like these are our recent homicides in the last 12 months uh, in LA using you know, all that open stuff. 
you can see what it looks like with the data layers, with more data layers on top. It kind of stays in the background uh, and lets the data do the speaking for itself, which is kind of a problem when you have something like Google Maps, which is really loud. It's good for streets. It's really good at locating where streets are, but it's not so good to put stuff on top of. Um, this is an analysis my colleague did. Uh, you can see it's on Quiet LA, using Leaflet, using all that good stuff. Um, and he did this all in PostJS. Uh, he wrote a giant GeoDjango app. He could keep running this ongoing if he got more data. Um, he wrote thousands and thousands of lines of Python code to make this reproducible, and you know it's it's sort of our tool, our tool of choice. Um, and what this is is 911 response times uh, in the city for the fire department. Um, so six minutes is sort of the uh, national standard. Um, the fire department was saying that they were besting that all the time. So we got all the data to see if that was true. Uh, anything that's green is within six minutes. Anything that's not green is over six minutes. Uh, do you think that they were correct? <laughs> And so, you know, we, we, he's been hammering the fire department pretty hard right now, I have to admit. But they, you know, they, were, they had problems in their code, and they were, they were sort of systematically lying whether they knew it or not. Uh, and we sort of blew the lid off of that using totally open tools, which is kind of, kind of amazing. Um, and in the process of this, you can see actually, too, it's at the borders of the city. It has a lot of problems because the, we realized that the city and the county don't cross over into each other. So you can see the gateway area down there, which is just all purple. Uh, and those, the bright purple in the middle up there is the Hollywood Hills, where it's kind of hard to get along those, those windy hills. So in some of the ritziest areas of LA, you probably, if you have a heart attack uh, and you live in the Hollywood Hills, you actually have a, a pretty high chance of not getting care within six minutes. Uh, and down there, you can see the county. There's probably, count, I think there's a county fire station right next to that purple area down at the, that little tiny thin line that goes down to the harbor. Uh, but the county doesn't cross over into the city. Um, and then he went into uh, OpenStreetMap, and he went in and traced uh, in Jossum or ID or whatever, and traced all of the uh, fire station buildings, and then contributed them to OpenStreetMap, because he had to geocode them himself, and he figured why not open source that and contribute that back. Uh, and that was pretty great. And I want to tell you, uh, this is a, a really great one that's really, really recent. Um, the Center for Investigative Reporting uh, and NPR. Uh, NPR did a project called Borderland. It's kind of a slideshow uh, of the border, you know, like things along the border, border issues. Um, somewhere on, you know, slide 26 of this was this map. And when I saw it at first, I didn't really think much of it. Uh, but when I was researching things for this talk, I, you know, I Googled well known news organizations plus the OpenStreetMap contribution line, and this popped up. And uh, I emailed Michael Corey, who I know at the Center for Investigative Reporting, and I asked him, what did you use OpenStreetMap for? And he, uh, what he said kind of blew my mind. He went in in 2012 and traced the border. He traced the whole border and put it into OpenStreetMap first. So instead of, you know, like a, a news organizations can be traditionally uh, conservative with their data, like, you know, we have it and we're gonna do analysis with it, but you know, you can't have it because you might scoop us. So he kind of, he told me this was kind of a radical experiment in his mind for just doing your work in the open. So he went out and he actually like did all this in the open. He tried for three years to get accurate border data from the government and they said it was a national security issue. He told me he thought that was kind of silly because you can see the goddamn fence. <laughs> and so, so he's, he said, screw it, and he went in, he traced it on, you know, in Jossum, he just traced the whole damn fence, him and, him and this woman, Tia. And uh, when NPR needed, you know, was doing a project on the border, they partnered with them, and he had a lot of experience with uh, things on the border, with, you know, border-related border fence issues, and he made this map based off of uh, his tracings, which is an open street map. And he built a GeoDjango app, because we as journalists love GeoDjango. Uh, that constantly pulls uh, OSM, OpenStreetMap, for change sets to his data. Um, I think partially he was seeing if, if government agencies would start deleting it, um, but partially I think he, you know, just wanted to see, just wanted to see if anybody changed his work, and a, a couple people did, um, and this is how he kept track of it, and he even, you know, created a proposed taxonomy for border fences. So this is, I think, probably the coolest use of like news open street map. I, I nev I've never considered this, I have to admit. Doing my work in open street map first. I'll do it in you know, anything before open street map, but who knows next time. 
Um, and he wrote up a great post about it uh, that he posted the other day. You can get it at that URL, let.ms slash CR border fence, where he just talked about how he did it and why he did it. Um, you know, there's some uses that we just can't shake of Google. Um, geocoding, as, you know, I might get tomatoes thrown at me, but I think Google still is the best geocoder. It's really hard to compete with people who have driven every street in the civilized world. Um, and uh, so we have, a, we have a tool called jQuery Geocodify that we use all the time on all of our projects that locates, you know, it's, it's a JavaScript based tool that locates points on all of our projects. And, you know, we would love to switch off to something else, but, but as far as we can tell, this is still the best way of doing it. Although it's still probably against their terms of service, almost almost certainly. But um, on that on that note, we would love to improve like the OpenStreetMap in the service of the geocoder. And so we actually have a uh, proposal that we just created to import all of the Los Angeles County uh, building shapes. They uh, it lied. They did lidar, you know, imaging of the whole city uh, years ago. And you used to it used to be only usable within the government. They wouldn't give it to us. Uh, and recently, since we're heavy users of the LA County GIS portal, they opened up this data in 2012, and we noticed it. And we would love to put in OpenStreetMap uh, if anybody wants to give us a hand on that. We also have addresses by uh, using the tax assessor's data. We're not 100% sure we can match them up faithfully. They also have a points file for addresses, too. So there's, you know, there's, like, there's a couple of different ways we can attack it. We're not 100% sure how to do it, but we would love some help. Uh, and that is at let.ms slash OSM buildings. That's where our proposal is. Uh, it contains like height data. So this is, uh, that's downtown LA, that black area right there. You can see USC uh, down there. And then that's sort of like the Wilshire corridor. We have lots of tall buildings. Um, and we would love, 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 love some help getting that in there so we can get off of Google for good and use OSM as our geocoder of choice. Um, thank you. I don't know how well I did on time, but uh, if you guys have any questions, I would love to take them. Yeah? 